Kia ora church and welcome to Surfside News. Well farmers, gardeners, households who run off water tanks, this week has certainly been a week of prayer being answered as we got to welcome some long awaited rain to our region. As we look ahead to what God's got going to do this week and in the future, it's always good to look back at God's faithfulness and how he has come through. Farms are looking fresher, grass is looking greener, plants are breathing a sigh of relief, and we are very grateful to God for how he has provided. This week, we are looking forward to Life Group. Our new series with Pastor Roger is sure to provoke plenty of great conversation, and Life Group is a great environment for that conversation to take place. Come along as we go deeper into the Sunday message, reflecting on what was said and considering how we can apply it to our day-to-day -day lives. If you know where you're going, get to it. But if you don't, then speak to one of our Life Group leaders or Assistant Pastor Norris Peart, who will let you know time and places. Up next, we are about to head into week two of our Signs of the Times series on Biblical Prophecy with Pastor Roger Peart. If you missed part one, then do check it out on our website, surfside.co.nz, or via the Surfside Church YouTube channel. But for now, it's back to you, Pastor, and we will see you next time. Last week, uh, as the team said, we, we started off in this new series, Sign of the Times, Bible Prophecy. We probably didn't start where many of you expected us to start. We started with the very first prophetic statements in the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, where God told Adam and Eve they could eat the fruit from any tree in the garden except from one tree. And this is where God made the first prophetic statement because it was a statement about an outcome that hadn't happened yet. And that's what prophecy is about. It's about a prediction of a future outcome that hasn't happened yet. And um, <coughs> in terms of this series, anyway, that's the um, basis that we're, we're looking at. And uh, so, except from one tree, and God said in Genesis 2 verse 17, if you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then along came the serpent, and he said uh, in Genesis 3 verse 4, you will not certainly die. Instead, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. That was the second prophetic statement in the Bible. And um, <clears throat> we just need to be aware that uh, not all sources of prophecy are true. Sadly, Adam and Eve were deceived, and all of creation, including us, have suffered the consequences ever since. Last week, we established a few prophetic principles uh, from these first few uh, verses of prophetic statements in the Bible. We need to realize, first of all, that when God makes us a prophetic statement, that he means it. And I think Adam and Eve, tragically, they discovered that. And, uh, and then we also learned that there can be layers of prophetic fulfillment because they didn't just die physically, they died spiritually in relationship to God, and then there was that outworking through their children and, and their descendants, and then all of creation was struggling because of the decision that they'd made, including right down to us today. So there can be layers of prophetic fulfillment. And as I mentioned earlier, not all prophecies are true. There are false prophets around, and we need to be discerning, we need to be wise, and we need to not be gullible and accept everything that somebody tells us. For example, we need to be aware of things like fortune tellers. There's a lot of people out there that think they've got prophetic giftings and they, they will tell you your fortune. And people might spend a lot of time studying horoscopes and things like that. But the, you're not going to be led into truth because the source of those things is deception. So stay away from that stuff. Just we need to be aware that not all prophecies are true. Adam and Eve discovered that, didn't they, with the serpent. And then the fourth point that we had last week <coughs> is that isolation brings vulnerability. And uh, it was uh, the serpent got Eve off by herself. And then they had a discussion and uh, then 
that she was fooled and Adam was fooled and then the whole thing started to unravel, whereas if they'd all been together, Adam and Eve and God, it would be very unlikely if that discussion would have ever taken place. And if it had, there would have been uh, some more <coughs> thinking around it. And so it's important that we stay connected in with each other and in God's family and with our own families as well and not get isolated when there's so much going on. So that was last week. Today we're going to continue in our series looking in Genesis, but particularly focusing on Noah and the flood today. There were a couple of other prophetic statements in between uh, Adam and Eve and Noah, and that was around Cain and Abel. Not quite so re- it was relevant for them and impacting for them, and there's some awesome principles in it, but not quite so relevant for us. Whereas Noah and the situation that he had to face is actually quite, uh, quite significant, and, and even in terms of uh, prophecy that hasn't happened yet. So let's read from Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 to 20. This is the account of Noah, actually through to 22. This is the, <coughs> the account of Noah and his family. Now, that might be up on the screen. If not, I'll just carry on, so don't worry about it. You can read it at home. It's, it's all there, reading from the NIV. Uh, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. A little bit like Adam and Eve had walked with God in the garden, and Noah had a relationship with God as well. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. It's interesting, isn't it, that when uh, now God hates violence between Uh, between each other and between nations and wars and all the stuff that's going on in the world today. Um, I think it's uh, just as we're shocked and disturbed by what we see happening around us, well, God is even more so. He hates violence, especially between people. And um, for the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long. We don't use the measurement of cubits these days, but that was about the equivalent of 135 metres long, 50 cubits wide, that's about 23 metres wide, and 30 cubits high, 14 metres. It was a pretty high structure, and it needed to be because they had uh, three decks. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high. All around, that's about 18 inches or so, a gap right around. So there was air and there was... uh, you know, a bit of fresh air coming through, they could all breathe and so on. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks, three decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all, all life under heaven, under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. We'll look at the, 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 the core prophetic statement that God made here is when God says in verse 17, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. That's a pretty dramatic prophetic prediction, isn't it, that God made? A worldwide flood that would destroy, destroy all life. And remember, need to remember that when he said that, it hadn't happened. Life was just continuing on as normal. And especially, it was, it was this particularly dramatic sort of a statement when you consider that up until that time, the Bible tells us that it never rained and that the earth was watered every day by heavy dews and 
mist and fog and that sort of thing, and there were springs of water all around that would just uh, flow out and water the ground. So it would have been very hard for anyone living at that time to believe that uh, this prediction, this prophecy that God made of what was going to happen in the future, that a flood like that could ever happen. People would have been very doubtful, wouldn't they? And then, of course, along with the prediction of a flood, Noah was given instructions of, to build a huge boat. Even the details of the type of wood, the specific measurements, and even a, a waterproof coating that he had, they had to put inside and out. And when you consider that Noah most likely lived miles from the sea, the whole thing really was a pretty big ask, wasn't it? It really was. It was a pretty, it, it was a sort of thing that actually, um, you know, if, if someone told us all that, would we believe it? And I mean, the reality is that uh, people today still don't even believe that it happened. This, this whole story of Noah and the flood, it's often relegated to children's books and, and it's just sort of a nice story, but actually we don't really believe that it happened. A lot of people think that. And yet, there's, I want, to, want you guys to realize that there's actually a lot of intelligent people out there, and particularly in the science community, that actually believe that there was a literal worldwide flood. And a lot of the things that, have, that, we can, that they can observe, even with the fossil record, and, and also the, the vast res, uh, reserves of, of gas and oil, where did all that come from? You know, there's actually, when you, when you look at it from a, a biblical mindset, instead of a, an evolutionary, evolutionary worldly mindset, actually, it's quite logical when people look back. And, they, and so, a lot of scientists don't actually believe that the earth is millions and millions and millions of years old at all. Because the biblical account puts this probably more like about 4,000 or so years ago, which is actually a very long time. But anyway, there's other people, uh, Marion and Fiona, and there's a few other people in our church here that really have some knowledge around this sort of thing, and scientists that uh, actually... So we, we don't need to um, throw our intelligence out when, we, when we're reading the Bible. We just need to look at it. Well, maybe this is possible. Maybe this really did happen. But just imagine that uh, for the people living there at that time, Wondering about, oh, is this really going to happen? Surely not. You know, it's never ever, well, what's all this business about a huge big flood covering the whole world? And uh, where would that water come from anyway? And it's never even rained. I think this is just a lot of um, imagination. And yet it is very clear that Noah believed God. Twice we're told in Genesis 6 verse 22 that we just read, and in chapter 7 verse 5, that Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And uh, we might have that verse up on the screen. <clears throat> and the reason, of course, that Noah did everything that God commanded him was because he believed God, and he took God at his word. And I think when we're dealing with the prophetic, we need to, and we learned last week, you know, God made a statement to Adam and Eve that they actually got tricked around and they didn't believe it. And it's the same with, with Noah. Noah actually really believed it, and yet all the rest of the world took no notice. Anyway, why are we starting our series, our Bible prophecy series, with Adam and Eve last week eating the forbidden fruit, and Noah today talking about a worldwide flood. You might be wondering. Well, quite simply, what we need to understand is that the events from the past, particularly biblical events, give us a framework of understanding regarding the future. That's the reason why we're doing this, so that we get a clear understanding of of who we are in, in creation and who God is and how God has worked in the past. And, and when, because there are these patterns and principles, some of them that we talked about last, last week, <clears throat> gives us a framework of understanding. And the need for the things that God predicts will come. I mean, when you think about the mess that Adam and Eve's choices have left, have left us, if you think about the, the mess that the world is in, today and, and the world has been in ever since, clearly 
you get a clearer understanding that, that there's a need for a solution, isn't there? There's a need for a solution to the mess that we've inherited through Adam and Eve and their choices. And uh, the need of a saviour, like what Marie talked about at communion. And many, we need to understand that many of the Old Testament prophecies, and we're going to look at some of these, point to Jesus thousands of years even before he came. And there's a prophetic flow right through the Bible, which is actually bringing uh, reconciliation and, res- and resolving some of these big problems that, that we, we've, we've inherited, not by our own choice. And secondly, it also gives us a pattern of how prophetic events may unfold in the future, especially in the case of Noah and the flood. And that's why we're looking at this today. God's Word tells us that there will be similarities between what happened in Noah's time and his response and the, and the second coming of Jesus, which hasn't happened yet. So that's why we're looking at some of this stuff, because it gives us a framework and an understanding. So we're talking about Bible prophecy here. We're not thinking, we're not talking about Roger's imagination of what the future and the prophecies mean. We're talking about, we're going to stick to the Bible here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, gives us a clear prophetic picture of the future. And this is what it says. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Moving into chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. No one will know the day or the hour when Jesus will return or when this, uh, this prophecy is likely to be fulfilled. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Remember we talked last week about the, the, the labor pains as we get nearer to the end, the, the frequency and the intensity of catastrophic events as we're getting closer and closer to the, to the uh, return of Jesus and the end of this age. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. See, here we have God warning us about a future event that clearly we need to be aware of, otherwise he wouldn't have put it in in the Word, in his Bible. And if you think about the future event prophesied here, you know, God's people being taken up into the clouds, taken out of this world. I mean, if you actually think about that, it sounds a little bit like science fiction, doesn't it? And, you know, what's, what's this all about? Could this really be true? It's probably not the kind of thing that you would tell your mates in the surf or at the rugby club, is it? That, you know, I believe that one day I'm going to be taken up into the clouds and I'm going to be taken out of this world. Um, think about it. It's not really logical, is it? And it's like nothing we have ever heard of before, is it? I've never seen anyone do that or heard of anything, but actually in the Bible, we have. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 tells us about a man who actually lived before the time of Noah, and he was, he was actually Noah's great-grandfather, and his name was Enoch. And the Bible tells us that Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. As far as I know, he's the only person in the Bible who has actually had that experience. Although, of course, Elijah is another one. The prophet Elijah, according to the biblical account, he didn't actually die. He simply went up in a chariot. And his friend Elisha was there and saw it and observed it. So there is a little bit of a precedent from biblical history to this sort of thing happening. Then, of course, Jesus himself at the ascension, the disciples were there, and they saw him go up. They were all gathered around. It's all written in the Bible and recorded there. That This sort of thing actually has happened in biblical history, but probably not in our lifetime. 
So we could be a little bit, oh, okay, don't know about all this. Jesus talked about this future event, God's people being taken up and rescued out of this world. And the interesting thing is that he linked it to the experience that Noah had, <clears throat> being rescued from this worldwide flood that God predicted would come. If we read about it in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44, it's headed up, the day and the hour unknown, verse, from verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. When your mates in the surf, if you're ever um, brave enough or foolish enough to tell them that one day you're just going to be taken up into the clouds and they ask you when, well, nobody knows that. So we just have to wait and see. Although actually the Bible does indicate that as God's people we should know the season and we shouldn't be caught out. But we will, no one will know the day or the hour. <clears throat> Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's Jesus speaking about himself. From the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Do you guys believe this? You know, it, it, actually, it actually changes our perspective, doesn't it, on life when we start to think about the possibility that this could be real, the stuff that's talked about in the Bible. Two men, this, and then he, Jesus goes on to explain <clears throat> what it's going to be like. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two people working out in the paddocks. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. Stay awake, stay alert, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. That's a pretty good example, isn't it, that Jesus gives. You know, if, if, if you're going to be burgled and you know that on Tuesday night, you know, they're going to be here at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, so what are you going to do at 2 o'clock in the morning? You're going to have all the lights on, you're going to be ready, you're going to have your shotgun, and, uh, and it's, going to, it's going to work out pretty badly for the burglars and uh, you're going to be okay. But anyway, understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. It would not have let his house be broken into. So, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, clearly there is a day coming that we need to be aware of and we need to be ready for, but if anyone tells you that it's a certain date or a certain time, the Bible says very, very clearly, and the Jehovah's Witnesses are classic at this. They love making predictions about when Jesus is returning and so on and so forth, and there's lots of other cults around out there that just keep doing this over and over. Don't be fooled. If anyone tells you it's a certain time, a certain place, or a certain day, well, the Bible says we will not have that information. <laughs> but we need to be ready just as Noah actually was ready. Luke puts it this way in Luke chapter 17. Verses 26 to 35. Just as it was in the days of Noah, this is actually uh, the apostle or the disciple Luke giving his uh, interpretation of what Jesus had said. Matthew gives his, his account and then Luke gives another one. So this is both accounts of what Jesus had said that actually really does confirm that Jesus talked about this because it's written more than once. Just as it was in the days of Noah so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. That's Jesus. That's the return of Jesus. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. Life is normal, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. This is interesting. This is a different bit of information that Luke brings in here. People were eating and drinking. They were buying and selling. They were planting and building. Business and life as usual. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. 
It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possess- possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. You remember what happened to Lot's wife? She was escaping with Lot. And the two angels were, t- were urging them to get out of here. God's going to bring judgment on this place. You guys need to get out of here. And they were leading them out. There was Lot and his wife and his two daughters. And uh, the, two, the two daughters, actually, they were engaged to be married probably to two awesome young men. But those guys, when the angels told them, and a lot said, come on, God, they said, no, I don't believe it. It's not going to happen. Why would we rush away from here? Look at this. It's just another night, another day like normal. You see, we need to understand that there will always be doubters. There will always be people who actually find this sort of stuff really difficult to accept. And uh, lots daughters, their two fiancés, actually missed out. They said, no, we're not going. This is a lot of rubbish. This is ridiculous. Don't believe all this sort of thing. And they stayed at the cost of their life. And Lot's wife, obviously, she, she had a lovely home. She had a lot of things that she was enjoying. And she had, had a garden party with her friends that day. And uh, she wanted to do a bit more shopping, and uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on in her life that she was looking forward to, and so she was longingly looking back. You know, so there's, a, there's a bit of a, a challenge there for us. That, you know, we live in the world, and we are, we're called to be responsible, we're called to work hard, we're called to make a difference, we're called to make the most of every day that we're given, but we mustn't fall so much in love with this world that we miss out on the better things that God's got for us in eternity. In life. But Lot's wife, she looked back and she missed out. Whoever tries to keep their life, this is what Jesus said, will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. You know, sometimes as believers, we, we actually have to step out of our comfort zone. And we have to say, well... Do I believe all this or not? Yes, actually I do. I believe that God loves me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that God's got an eternity in store for me. But we've got to actually step into it and accept it and take it and and take hold of it. Because if we keep on in the world of wondering and doubting and not sure and we're in one camp or the other, there's a risk that actually when the time comes, we could miss out on the blessings that God's got for us. So let's not hang on too hard to this life because Jesus warned us that we need to be willing to let it go. And, that, and most of that, I think, is probably around what people might think of us for coming to church, for being Christians, for believing some of this stuff. You know, people sometimes think we're on another planet, don't they, when we, when we believe this stuff. But we need to say, okay, well, if it's true, I believe it, like, uh, like Noah, and just get on with it. Anyway, um, carried on, we'll continue on in Luke 17. I tell you, on that night, this is Jesus talking, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. You know... <clears throat> Sometimes there's a little bit of discussion around whether the earth is flat or round, which I can't really believe. But anyway, I think there's pretty clear evidence here that Jesus knew that the world was round because he talks about two men working in the field, which happens during the day, right? And he also talked about two people that sleep at night, At the same time, when Jesus comes, there's going to be people that are out there working, carrying on with their day, and there's going to be people that are asleep in bed. And I think Jesus understood that because he knew that the world was round and there's different time zones. And some people, when he returns, are going to be out there doing stuff. Other people are going to be in the evening getting drowsy. Other people are going to be dead to the world because it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Other people will be just waking up because it's uh, going to milk the cows because it's 5 o'clock. 
So, you know, I think there's, let's just, I'll just throw that in as a possibility that maybe there's a little indication there that actually Jesus knew. He didn't obviously go into a great science lesson over it because he wasn't concerned about that because he's concerned about our relationship with him and our eternity. That's what God is concerned about. Then there's a prophetic pattern here through this, what Jesus says. Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. Seven people were rescued from the flood. And just at the last minute, actually. And God shut the door of the ark after they'd gone in. I was thinking about that. Maybe Noah had a little bit of uh, an oversight there. Maybe he got in and, oh, how are we going to shut the door? Because he hadn't thought about that. But it's okay, because God was there, and God shut the door. Isn't that interesting? And then there was Lot and his two daughters. We've talked about the fact that uh, there, could, there should have been more of them. There was only three people that were rescued from the judgment that God poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. And just in time, just in time, that very day, the judgment came. And I don't know whether that was a volcanic eruption or something from heaven, supernatural or whatever it was, but there's evidence that actually that really did happen. Just in time, the angels led them out. And God's word predicts and prophesied that we as God's people will also be rescued from the judgment that is coming on the whole world, but probably just in time. There's a time coming on the world that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And of course, there's a lot of discussion and controversy as to whether Christians will have to be there and go through this time or not. Jesus made it very clear, the Bible makes it very clear there's going to be such a terrible time that actually, if God, if Jesus himself hadn't stepped in the whole world, world would be destroyed. Probably nuclear war and all sorts of stuff going on. What's happening in Ukraine is just a little side show compared to what's going to be happening at the very end of time. But the question is, will we have to go through that time? My personal belief now is that actually, no, we won't. As God's people, I don't think we will. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, we're told, For God, this is immediately after the bit that we read earlier, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't take any pleasure, and, and didn't, wouldn't have taken any pleasure in Noah getting drowned in the flood. That's why he rescued him. That's why he rescued his family. That's why he rescued all. God doesn't take any pleasure in, in Lot and his family being destroyed. And he doesn't take any pleasure actually in anybody being destroyed, but I think we need to understand that God is a God of justice and eventually he leaves things to run for a long, long time, doesn't he? He leaves, things, leaves us to our own devices for a long, long time, but eventually we're all going to have to be called to account for the life that we've lived and the things that we've said and the things that we've done. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm believing now that, um, and in fact, in the past, I wasn't sure about this. And it doesn't matter if we're not sure. If you think we're going through the tribulation, and uh, that's okay. <coughs> I think there's a lot of people are going to be saved during that time because they're going to realize that some of the crazy things that preachers have said in the past actually have come true. And they're going to realize that God really does mean what he says and that they're in the middle of it. And they're going to be freaking out and, and, and giving their lives to Jesus at that point. But for those of us that believe right now, my personal opinion is that we do not need to go through that terrible time at the end of the age. There's plenty to think about. But I think the main thing that we need to understand is that there are things coming that the Bible predicts and makes clear and we need to be ready so I want to finish up today thinking about Noah building the boat, building the ark. Noah and his boys were getting ready 
for what was to come. Next week, I want to talk a bit about the boys, because I reckon they're a couple of heroes, three heroes, those guys, the way they, you know, they worked and they supported their dad and so on. So we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. But there they were, they were getting ready, they were building the ark, it was a pretty big project. Actually, I think for the time that they were in, it was a massive project, probably almost in the impossible uh, realm. This ark, as we mentioned, was 135 metres long. That is longer than a rugby field. A rugby field is 100 metres, so it was one in a third rugby fields, just to put it in perspective, how big the ark was. And of course, it was uh, wide and high and all the rest of it. It was a, a pretty massive project. An awful lot of timber required for a project like that. And Noah and his sons, they would have had to log the trees. I don't think they could just go down to the timber yard and put an order in for you know, a couple of million cubic meters of, of sawn timber that we can just uh, you know, quickly put together. They probably had to go and log the trees. They had to drag them back to the farm. They probably didn't have enough on their own land. We know that Noah was a man of the soil. The Bible tells us that. He was probably a farmer. And uh, they had to mill them by hand. As far as I know, they didn't have electricity, but we don't know back then. So it was probably a, a long, laborious job just simply getting the timber ready. And then they had to cut everything into shape, and they had to attach them together, and it had to be strong. All those animals that they were going to have on board and, and uh, all the pressure from the waves and the water and all the rest of it, it had to be well built. A leaky ark would not be much use, would it? Think about it. Think about the project that they had. And they had to have spaces for the animals and spaces for feed and space for the family. And they had to have a watering system of some kind. And it had to be all waterproof perfectly. With, and God told them how to do that, paint it with pitch on the inside, on the, on the outside. And all the way through, they still had to run the farm and, and live. And even just getting feed for all the animals that were ended up being on the ark for, for about a year. The Bible tells us. And all the time, people would be coming along and asking, what are you guys up to? What's this huge big thing you're building? And why?" And they'd probably laugh about it. And what on earth are you guys doing? And I wonder if during the process that Noah ever doubted. I think he might have ever doubted. I think he would have had his questions to God. Is this really going to happen. It was not only a huge project and a lot of work and costly, probably took all of Noah's resources and more. He might have even had to go to the bank and take out another mortgage to do this. I mean, let's be real. It's a huge project. And we don't know how exactly how long it took them, but it took them years and years and years possibly up to 100 years, but I think it was probably more like about 50 or 60 or 70 years that they were working on this project. We're not quite clear from the biblical record. But in the end, they got there. If you think about the process, it must have taken a lot of faith, mustn't it, to keep going for all those years with all the doubters and with even with the thoughts in their own mind and their concerns and how they're going to do it and must have taken a lot of persistence to keep going and unwavering integrity. Think about it. They didn't give up halfway through. They didn't get out there with the flood and find, oh, they'd forgotten to build the door. They'd forgotten how to shut it, but they, at least they had a door. And the reality is that if we believe the biblical account, and personally I do, I believe it. No reason why it shouldn't have happened exactly like the Bible said. The reality is that you and I are here today because of the obedience and the faith and the integrity of Noah. If we believe this account, none of us would be here if he hadn't followed through with the project that God asked him to do. 
God took, Noah took God's word seriously, didn't he? He took that prediction, that prophetic prediction about a worldwide flood and the need for him to be prepared. He took it seriously and he believed God and all creation, including us, are blessed because of the decisions and the choices that he made. And after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah, which is another amazing prophetic statement. And he said to Noah that there will never be another worldwide flood ever again. God promised that. In Genesis 8 verse 22, this is God's prophetic promise to Noah. He said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, God said this. He said, I'm going to give you a sign of my covenant. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Has anyone noticed any rainbows lately? Yeah, we've had a lot this last week. And we need to remember that actually this is a a sign of God's promise to us as the descendants of of Noah, which we all are, that God will never judge the earth in the same way with a huge flood like he did back then. Of course, there is an attempt to change the meaning of the sign of the rainbow, but that's another whole story. So the next time we see a rainbow in the sky, let's remember God's prophetic promise. And in spite of all the fear in the world today about climate change, and all the disasters, and people are fearful and worried about all sorts of things. God's Word promises that life will continue right to the end of the age. There will be seasons, there will be springtime, there will be harvest, there will be day, there will be night, there will be heat, there will be cold. Things will continue right until the the time when Jesus returns at the very end. So we don't have to be fearful, we don't have to be worried, because what God says He means And you and I can face the future with a sense of certainty that actually we're going to get through all this stuff. I think we can even have a sense of excitement about the future, knowing that God's got this. Just like he had the door of the ark sorted. He closed that at the right time. He's going to look after us as people. He's going to get us through the season that we're in of uncertainty and fear and tumult and all sorts of stuff going on as we come towards the the final uh, showdown, as it were. We're going to be okay. And it might even be that God will actually take us out just in time before we have to go through all this. So, anyway, that's just some thoughts today. Uh, Next week we will continue on. As I said, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about Noah's boys next week and uh, just how what incredible guys they were and how what sort of people we need to be in the season that we're living in. So there's a there's a little bit of a heads up on perhaps where we're heading next week. So anyway, bless you guys and uh, how about if we stand? Let's get ready to worship God and. uh,